The summer of 1982 was a huge year for science fiction movies. Eight sci-fi films were released within six weeks of one another, including E.T., Tron, Blade Runner, and Poltergeist. Former entertainment critic for Entertainment Weekly, Chris Nashawadi, explores how these films altered the art of movie making and changed the careers of some of Hollywood's biggest names. It was called The Future Was Now, Mad Men Mavericks in the Epic Sci-Fi Summer of 1982. Chris joins us now. Thanks for being hey, with Chris. us. Hey, Chris. Hey, guys, congratulations on your big day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I got to tell you, I mean, I remember going to see these movies in the summer of 82, and I don't, I guess in perspective, I never thought of what an unusual summer that was. Yeah, I mean, no one really recognizes these things in the moment, right? Yeah. It's, uh, it's something that only becomes obvious after the fact. <laughs> uh, but yeah. If, if you were going to the movies in the summer of 1982, you were uh, a very, very lucky boy or girl. Uh, what did the Hollywood studio executives get wrong about sci-fi? They, they were not hot for it. It just kind of exploded, and it was a surprise to them. Yeah, I think um, Star Wars in 1977 really um, opened their eyes to the possibilities of, of this genre, which had been considered either, you know, sort of corny kid stuff, or um, just geeky and too geeky for the mainstream. But what they didn't realize is when Star Wars came out and everyone went to see it, uh, is that that geeky audience was the mainstream. <laughs> yeah. So why didn't this epic summer happen in 1977? Did it take other uh, people to catch up on that and decided to, to release different smaller sci-fi stuff based on Star Wars popularity? Well, Hollywood is such a, a big... Uh, and time-consuming industry. Uh, movies, they're like battleships. They take a long time to turn around. So, mm. um, you know, it, when Star Wars comes out in 77, everyone immediately scrambles to see what sort of sci-fi movies we can make, but it takes time to develop them and make mm. them and cast them. So uh, usually in Hollywood, you, you, you come with a, up with a, a time like five years to, to sort of capture the whole development process. Yeah. Uh, there were some earlier tremors of it. Uh, you know, there were a couple uh, earlier science fiction movies, but this is really the summer when it all came together. And I, I was surprised to read that Spielberg wanted a darker thread in E.T., which seems like such a perfect film and, and kind of unique in the sense that it was a, a happy alien. Uh, talk about what that dark thread was and why it, it never came to be. Yeah, the, the movie started off as a much darker idea. It was going to involve a group of aliens um, getting trapped on Earth. Uh, uh, and, and only one of the five or so aliens was actually uh, good. The, the rest were, were a little bit evil. Uh, so it had more of a, an alien invasion thing rather than a, you know, a kindly uh, alien far from home, lost and, 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 and scared and vulnerable. And, and, and it was only over time that Spielberg sort of second guessed um, the sort of darker impulses he had and, and thought that maybe he was ready to do something lighter, um, sunnier, or more optimistic and for kids. So, uh, you know, he wasn't, not everyone was happy about it. This, the, the movie was originally set up at another studio and that when they read his kinder, happier uh, script, they were like, uh, we don't want to make this movie. Uh, this is not what we signed up for. We wanted a movie from the director of Jaws. Um, mm -hmm. This is a, a, a wimpy, I think they call it a wimpy Disney movie. Uh, who, was that, <laughs> Disney who was that genius who cast become it? The biggest... Yeah. Yeah. I, was, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was saying, who's that genius that passed on E.T.? Well, it was, <laughs> I'm not going to single out people's <laughs> names, but let's just say that Steven Spielberg had it in his contract for years that he wouldn't have to work with that guy again. Oh, ah. my gosh. You know what? And I, you mentioned Tron is one of these movies. I know it's a big ride at, you know, in, in one of the theme parks now, too. I don't remember seeing it. I remember seeing with the motorcycles and the blue lights. But you say that movie had a big impact on Pixar. Yeah, there really would be no Pixar without... Uh, without Tron, you know, none other than the director of Toy Story said that. And it's true. I mean, when we think about animation today, um, you know, most of the movies that are animated are computer generated. And that really was um, something that, that Tron created, you know, at Disney was the famous animation studio. He, uh, the director of Tron, Steven Lisberger, was the one who sort of brought them into the future. Wow.
Uh, we've talked a lot about movies. Let's talk about a person. The other day we showed a clip of Arnold Schwarzenegger from I think his first movie that was laughably horrible. Um, talk about his evolution and, and what he was like uh, on set. Yeah, I think Schwarzenegger is really one of the most interesting characters in the book simply because, you know, here was a kid who grew up in Austria and, you know, uh, really had this this driving hunger and, and ambition to become a star. And he first accomplishes this in the world of bodybuilding, uh, where he wins, you know, a string of titles, becomes the most famous bodybuilder in the world. But that's really a very niche world. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there was a documentary called Pumping Iron that came out that chronicled him in that world. And, and he really took that as a, as, a, as a springboard to become a movie star. Yeah. I was just cringing at him yeah. biting someone's ear off in the in the Conan clip there. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah, I didn't yeah. mean to derail you. <laughs> but you said he had That's to okay. he had to put up with a lot of indignities on that set, right? Yeah, he was, you know, he was hunted down by wolves. He had a lot of injuries. Uh, you know, they put meat in his backpack so the wolves would be hungry for him and and they got him. Uh, you know, he uh, sliced his neck near his jugular uh, in some of the sword fighting. But wow. he's someone who welcomes pain, you know? I mean, that's what he does. Yeah. It, it, as a bodybuilder, um, you know, you don't, you don't gain without pain. So he <laughs> was all for it. That's great. The book is The Future Was Now, Mad Men, Mavericks, and the Epic Sci-Fi Summer of 1982. You can follow Chris on X. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, guys.